Hi everyone, so my name is Christine Sincata. I'm a senior neuroscience major, and for the past couple of years, I've been working in the Ramirez lab here on campus. We are a memory lab, um, and we specifically look at memory manipulation. So for my senior project, I was looking at memory manipulation in an animal model of addiction using a technique called optogenetics. So <laughs> I'm sure one way or another, we've all kind of figured out that alcohol can really influence your memory. And the reason this happens is because when you consume alcohol and it enters your bloodstream, it travels into your brain where it directly influences your memory system. It also influences other cognitive systems, including stress, emotions, motor, et cetera. And so on a little bit of a personal note, um, that's me and that's my dad. And as you can see on the right, my dad was in the NYPD. He was in the NYPD for a little bit over 20 years. Um, he was a first responder to 9-11 and saw many other really emotionally trying and uh, sad events and experiences. And so with that being said, my dad is also a recovering alcoholic. He struggled with sobriety for my entire life. Um, and it wasn't until I was 17 or 18 where he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, um, directly related to his time in the NYPD. And so the reason I wanted to share that about my dad is it's extremely common for someone with PTSD to also suffer from a substance use disorder. Um, so here are just some stats. Roughly at any given time, 8% of Americans are considered to have PTSD. In addition to that, um, the NIH has figured out that around 6.2% of Americans over the age of 18 um, qualify as having an alcohol use disorder. And then depending on which studies you read and the demographics you look at, uh, there's reports of comorbidity for these two disorders ranging from 30 to 75%. And so with that being said, my project is looking at the effects of both PTSD and AUDs on memory. And so in my lab, we use an animal model, we use mice. Um, and mice are a really great tool for studying memory because they have a lot of analogous brain structures to humans. So in this figure on the right, um, the first column shows a rat brain, the center a monkey brain, and the third is a human brain. And so the region of interest in my lab is the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is the central region for all things memory. It's where memories are formed. The hippocampus facilitates the storage and the retrieval of memories. So in the top row here, you have a 3D rendering of the hippocampus in each organism. In the center row, the hippocampus is highlighted in red to show the location in the brain. And then down in this bottom row is just an example of the cross section of a hippocampus in a brain slice. And so I've mentioned twice now that my lab looks at memory and memory manipulation. So the way we do that is with a technique called optogenetics. So literally, physically, the brain is a very dark place. Um, brain cells do not respond to light. But with optogenetics, um, this is a really cool technique that allows researchers like myself to introduce a biological switch into the brain. And so this switch can adhere to specific neurons, such as this one here. Um, the switch is called channel rhodopsin. It's represented as these green little dots on this neuron. And so with channel rhodopsin, with this switch, we are able to go into the brain and shine light directly on these cells. And so with the click of the button, at the speed of light, I can hijack cells to artificially turn them on or off. And so when you use optogenetics in the hippocampus, um, we are able to selectively tag cells that are specific to a exact memory. And so in this image here, this is a cross section of the hippocampus as was shown in the previous figure. And these bright green cells here are in a region, a subregion called the dentate gyrus. So this is the region within the hippocampus that is especially active during the formation of a memory. And so the switch that we introduce is activity dependent, meaning it will only adhere to cells that are active, which is how we are able to tag a very specific ensemble. And the field has kind of termed this ensemble engram cells. So when we use light to reactivate an engram, we are reactivating a specific memory in the mouse. So moving on to the actual project, I say that I use an animal model of addiction and PTSD. So before I can move into optogenetic experiments, I had to verify that this model would work. Um, and so the way I did that was by first taking normal mice and giving them five days of either ethanol or saline exposure as a control. And so after they receive five days of chronic alcohol exposure, they are withdrawn for two days before we start our behavioral paradigm. 
So on the first day of behavior here, um, I placed the mice in a box, we call it context A, and they receive several mild foot shocks. And so this serves as the traumatic event. Now, extinction training is the practice of continually putting the mice back into the original context that they were shocked. And over time, a normal mouse will learn that this environment is no longer threatening. Um, and the way that we determine that is based on a behavior called freezing. So when mice are scared, they engage in freezing behavior. Um, typically, a mouse is a very curious animal. They want to explore their environments. They move around. They smell things. But when they're scared, they go to the corner, they hunch over, they try not to move any part of their body. So with extinction training, we expect to see over time a decrease in freezing to show that the mouse is less and less scared. You'll see here that I actually fear condition in two different contexts. And the reason we do that is as a control to determine how much our mice are generalizing across contexts. So when we look at the extinction data, I, um, our extinction paradigm is twice a day for 10 minutes a day um, over the course of five days. So you can see at the red line here, um, represents the ethanol withdrawn mice. So they are freezing at significantly higher levels than the saline control mice, specifically in the morning sessions on day three, four, and five. And so following extinction, we do a final context test. And all that entails is just putting the mice back into each context one last time for about five minutes to evaluate their freezing levels. And what we see here is that the mice that are withdrawn from ethanol with the red bars here, uh, in context A are freezing at a significantly higher level than the saline control mice. Additionally, in context B, both groups are freezing higher than they are in context A. So the punchline here is that mice who had chronic ethanol exposure and then are withdrawn from alcohol have an impaired ability to attenuate their fear memories. And so for my project, what I wanted to do was see if we could do this artificially. Using optogenetics, could I chronically reactivate a fear memory to kind of elicit and produce extinction-like behavioral effects? Would I be able to get a decrease in freezing just by reactivating the memory of fear? And so the paradigm for this is pretty similar to the normative animals. Um, optogenetic experiments start with a brief surgery where we introduce that switch into the brain and then also implant the optic fibers that we'll use to shine light onto the cells. Once the animals recover, just as before, they are given five days of either alcohol or saline exposure, and then fear conditioned in both context A and context B. You'll see here that I have on docs and off docs written. Um, docs is just a special type of food that prevents the switch from adhering to cells. So when we take the animals off docs, this allows for the switch to attach to those cells that are active during the memory formation. And so instead of extinction here, we place the mice into a third additional context where they have no fear, no associations um, with that room. And when I say we change the context, we're changing the light, the smell, um, the feeling of the floor, any kind of contextual clues like that. And so similarly to extinction, for over the course of five days, for twice a day, 10 minutes each session, I put the mouse into the box and use light to chronically reactivate the fear memory. And as you can see here, we have a very similar pattern to the normative extinction. Over the course of 10 sessions, we are able to elicit a decrease in freezing in both groups of mice. And what's really exciting here is that there is no statistical significant difference between the ethanol withdrawn groups and the saline control groups. And so finally, with the context tests, um, we see no significant difference between the two groups. And so that was really exciting because the punchline here is that chronic optogenetic reactivation of a fear memory was equally as effective in reducing freezing in both the ethanol withdrawn and the saline control groups. Also, when we look at context B, the mice are freezing at a significantly lower level than they are in context B, which kind of indicates that our chronic reactivation of the fear engram is context specific as is normative extinction. And so just to reiterate, um, chronic optogenetic reactivation vaguely works. Um, and so what this means is not that we will be doing opto anytime in the near future in humans. Uh, that would be wildly unethical. But um, this kind of information helps to elucidate neural circuits that are associated with stress, memory, and addiction, and kind of can give some hints for translational applications looking at similar behaviors in humans. Um, 
and I would like to thank my lab. Um, I'd like to thank some people who are not in the room right now because they all ditched me to go to a conference in California this weekend, which is totally valid. Um, Steve is my mentor. Uh, Nathan is a postdoc who helped me get this project off the ground. Stella is another postdoc who trained me, and then Olivia and Emily helped me out with doing surgeries and running behavior and everything like that. Thank you. <laughs>